Today on the show, we've got Dr. Gary Forsman. It, a long time, I've known Gary for over 25 years. He's a doctor from, medical doctor from California. And uh, he was ranked one of the top in the nation in his internal medicine board exams and has some of the most comprehensive internal medicine training to be found, including serving as a clinical professor who trained other physicians at the University Medical Center. And, but then, Gary, as he explains in the podcast, uh, he was a little bit disillusioned with Western medicine and is now an integrative um, uh, physician where he integrates all kinds of holistic practices. Yeah. And he talks about his spiritual journey and it was a great conversation, right? Yeah, I, I really uh, thought it was a, a very, very deep, interesting perspective into somebody who's in the you know medical community, um, but also has a holistic practice. Uh, which is the the middle path medicine right uh, yeah. California and um, yeah it's just really fascinating perspective on integrating all medicines uh, you know whether it be emotional psychological or uh, you know actual you know drug medicine so yeah I hope you guys enjoy it it's a uh, it's a great look into a, a very unique perspective all right, Gary. So the question we start off our podcast in is, do you recall when you became a seeker? Wow. A seeker. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Uh, I've, you know, cause I was like, you use the term turning points where I've used inflection points throughout my life and nice. same concept. And, uh, in terms of one's a little bit more calculus and other things and more doctory and stuff, but I like turning points. I like inflection points. Um, the seeker thing happened concurrently for me um, early in uh, when I, as a, so for everybody out there, uh, went to University of Florida Medical School, was lucky to kind of get in kind of early and was kind of young going into my residency. Um, I finished my residency. I was an assistant clinical professor at a university in California. And during my first year there, when I was a professor, um, I had, was treating a patient. I had continued some medicines that um, another doctor prescribed, a medicine called naproxen, which back then you needed a prescription for. Now it's over the counter. But um, my moment really was, um, this is a medicine, um, and which led to this, the seeking thing. My, my moment was when the person almost died. They had a massive GI bleed, almost died from a medicine that I was prescribing. Now, you have to understand, I had a lot of ego at those days. Uh, um, I was the best at being a doctor. I had just scored in the top percentiles of the boards. I knew everything there was to know about medicine. Um, that's the way I saw myself, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, that goes into our delusions, right? Um, and so, and the when this person almost died from a prescription that couldn't save her life, by the way, it was just helping her symptoms. And what really got to me, everybody, was that all the doctors kept telling me I hadn't done anything wrong. I hadn't done anything wrong um, when I had done everything freaking wrong. <laughs> and, and it was like this... I was almost more bothered by the condolences of the other, these are university professors, um, more bothered by their condolences of me almost than I was at almost killing someone, you know? Um, and so they did survive and, and this medicine now is over the counter so everybody can just kill themselves for free. <laughs> um, and so, um, but I felt really bad in the day, you know? And so, um, and, and that led to this kind of like, wow, it was almost like the moment my brother told me wasn't any Santa Claus. Um, and all of a sudden I knew it was the Easter bunny and everything else, everything was a lie. Um, and I had that kind of moment with Western medicine. I had put so much of my heart and soul into it that I was like, I, everything I've learned has been wrong. I, I really want to help people. I must need to learn more stuff. Okay. Um, and that's kind of, it was like this aha moment and everything shifted for me. Uh, at the very same time, a friend said, hey, you know, there's this guy named Deepak Chopra. And I go, well, that sounds kind of funny. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he wrote this book called Quantum Healing. All right, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going through a little bit of a crisis. Um, <laughs> so I read it, you know, 
he was a big transcendental meditator. And then, of course, I had read the book. And, of course, then Deepak was, you know, kind of cast out of the TM organization. Um, and I, I, t I already told him, it's too late. I'm going to go visit Deepak. And I, I loved Deepak and uh, still do. But, um, but in a formative length of time, I went into studying Ayurvedic medicine. And, of course, every other system of medicine that I had shunned because Western medicine was the shiz um, and everything else was the nizzle i don't know but it was something else um it wasn't the shiz um and so um and chiropractic and really i've been on an adventure of kind of healing everything which of course takes us into our spirit to psychophysicalness and so um and you can't heal um at people at any level and as you know i'm a big fan of Ken Wilbur, and, and we could go on and on about how I view healing now, but it certainly wasn't giving drugs to people <laughs> as being the primary thing that you do. Um, and that was really the key into my spirituality. When I say that as well, I had had horrible headaches in medical school and learned this thing called the relaxation response from Herbert Benson, was a former TMer as well. And that had helped to some degree, but I had started to learn TM. It kind of goes on from there, a whole confluence of events. But the biggest true turning point or inflection point for me was this moment when I almost killed a patient with my own, with a prescription and I, how I had to change everything that I had done because everything I learned up to that point, what if it wasn't a lie, it certainly wasn't the complete truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, and I had spent so much money, so many hours, so many tears at that point of my life to think that I had worked that hard to have such a fractional view of medicine was really quite tragic. <laughs> well, Sorry. The um, tragic, but but also, you know, taking that, yes, all, all this time, money and energy and belief system brought you to this realization that it wasn't complete. I mean, would you have had that experience if you didn't put all that time and money and energy into into that yeah exactly i mean because you i don't know when i say that for me uh, absolutely i think that was a part of the genesis of you know of realizing wow i put so much into this most doctors seem to have these same kind of moments and they seem to just keep the wanting to go further into, well, if I just learned more, well, I've just learned, you know, and, you know, again, that was partly where my arrogance kind of came in because like, shit, I, nobody can learn more than me. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly it's not that I'm going to get better at this really good already. Um, <laughs> so, so, what, <laughs> so what do you think differentiates, you, you said that you, you've recognized, and I'm assuming you've talked with a lot of other doctors who've had a similar realization and obviously i'm sure you can't give names or you know specific stories of course but um you, you know you've had conversations where you both realize that th there is a lacking of completeness let's just be kind to the uh western medical system is there's a lacking mm -hmm. of completeness right. there so if you have this both the similar uh, similar situation and you also had the inclination of well if i just know if i learn more that will get me past this lacking of information. But you had a you have a different twist. You, you had something else come into you that made you look outside of Western medicine. What 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 do you think made you look outside of Western medicine versus what you think might make other doctors? And obviously, you're going to speak for other people here. But what what do you think makes them not turn to other alternative means of healing? I think that's changed over the years. I have the benefit of kind of growing up in the 80s. Um, I don't know if you can call that a benefit anymore. Look what my generation has done for the world. Um, the uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but I did have that benefit, um, and that when you came out of medical school, there was that you. It seemed like a huge debt to you at the time in the residencies, but it's nothing like what the kids the kids, the younger doctors face these days, okay? Um, and so I had a friend who just visited yesterday um, who went through this and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. All of our views for medicine have changed. And I, I really am answering your question that there's so much more burden on them to be part of a system mm -hmm. that they have to become part of an HMO doctor or whatever else to pay the money to have some form of lifestyle because they've they've given up their lifestyle for six, seven, eight years, uh, really working their asses off. Um, and uh, and they want to have a home. They want to have some other 
other things and they can't do that in certain areas. They have to be conformed. It's almost like indentured servants, okay? And that's what's happened, I think, over the last 40 years is we've created an entire population of indentured servants and um, that are part, and the doctors are part of it. I wanna make be clear, um, they don't have the freedom to do some of the change, make some of the differences, changes that I did. I think as well to answer your question was, I was lucky enough to get blistering headaches in medical school. I, I mean, seriously, that step looking into uh, med uh, meditation and stress management, I had started to do a medical school because, you know, so here I am like 19 or 20 at the time, and I'm just having these horrible headaches. Fortunately, I had a pharmacist roommate, actually, <laughs> and that goes into a whole bunch of other stories, by the way. Um, the uh, and, and let's stick with the ones that had to do with like things like Advil and ibuprofen, and, and I was taking those to the point where I I knew one day I had an ulcer and I said, I can't, I, as, as much as it works to treat my headache, it's really not working. And so, and I said, and I also thought, what's wrong with me? Am I, why am I getting so many headaches? Cause I was studying so hard and, but other people were studying too. And I stopped like, I, God, I'm just weak or something. And, and I, I had this moment when I realized I was just treating the symptoms, just like I did with the same medicine that nearly killed this other person. Okay. Um, and so, and I couldn't do that anymore because I knew I had an ulcer. Let's look for something else. And that's where I, I turned to massage first. I'm going to be clear about that. You know, getting, getting people to rub your neck is a really good answer to this. Uh, it was just lining them all up in a row and doing all those other things was kind of difficult. Um, <laughs> And so I went, wait a minute, this is my stress response to medical school. I have always wanted to go to medical school. I am not going to change my stress response. I am going to, I'm not going to change my stress or, but I can change my stress response. And that's when I started to look into what is a stress response. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is, by the way, is I looked out and all of a sudden I realized, well, maybe I'm getting headaches. This person's getting, um, this pe pe people are getting divorced during medical school. These people are doing drugs. There was a whole host of pathology in my medical class, okay? Um, and <laughs> I mean, a, a variety of things. And I realized that, and that just at that time we were coming into stress being the number one killer. So it really became what is stress. And of course that goes into our perception of reality as being the biggest stressor, right? Mm -hmm. So if I could share my perception that took a length of time but it really became clear to me about there is more to this world than just the physical side of things and so um I, so i got lucky because i had had horrible headaches seriously um migraine equivalents along with stress and tension headaches and things um and had to find a way to treat it that wasn't going to be standard western medicine then i had these other experiences and and furthermore, my life just seems to be filled with these little turning points all along the way to let me know that I was on the wrong path or the right path. And this was just, this seemed to be another one of them. And so was it the meditation that helped you with the, with the headaches finally or? Uh, let's see, because the drugs I couldn't use anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the answer is yes, everybody. It was a combination of things. First of all, recognizing that stress affected everybody differently. And this was my stress response. And I knew why I had the headaches. So knowledge can be power sometimes. It's like, I know these are headaches. And not that I thought I had a brain tumor or anything else horrible, but you know, it always occurs to you like, like what's wrong with me to have such bad headaches? And if it's stress, why doesn't it happen to other people? And the answer is it was happening to other people. Uh, on, on a side note, it was a good percentage of the top 10 of my class was dead within the first 10 years after medical school, by the way. And we were fairly young and they died from different diseases. So I also had this perception some people were just good at dealing with stress. And no, they were just good internalizers. Wow. They developed autoimmune diseases and cancers. And that, and that was another further follow-up. It's like, man, this stress thing is huge. And so, yes, when I went from progressive relaxation to transcendental meditation, and then primordial sound meditation that was taught through uh, Deepak Chopra and things really was a system that I still use actually, um, primarily. I've learned many, many, many things, I'm sure like you, Corinne, but I'm, you know, so many other things since then, but that's still one of my anchor meditation systems. And so, and yes, meditation was a key thing that changed the way I see the world. So now, as I tell everybody, your symptoms are your teachers. 
I get a headache, and I'm not saying I would never even take if it's bad enough a, a, an, an Advil or anything else if I needed to. I would, because um, I would do it on occasion. What I would do is then say, wow, what is that headache all about? And then treat that, because it's pretty clear to me in terms of what it is at the time. So our symptoms are our teachers becomes one of these great things of all times in medicine that seem to be lost, because Western medicine is the greatest ever expunger of the symptom uh, medicine, which is like expunging your teachers. and, and and again, and that became an entire policy since 2016. Um, and so, and then we have a lack, loss of actual true learning, you know, and so, um, and that's the key in medicine that the doctor is to teach. And so, so when, you know, the way I do medicine now is so much different than I did back then. And furthermore, once I expanded what I had to know, it becomes the most humbling thing in the world about how little you know as a human being. I, I you know, I, I, I joke with the, the patients who know me. It's like, if you really understood how humbled by how little I know, um, <laughs> you you'd probably wouldn't want to see me <laughs> because I, I really feel that way so legitimately now. Um, and, but it wouldn't be a good sales pick. Come to, come to see Dr. Forsman. He's, ex he's just, I was so overwhelmed by how little he knows is not a good sales pitch. Um, and so, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, and so, uh, but yes, uh, the meditation was the key part of dealing with the headaches and yes, beginning to see reality more clearly, you know, and it's interesting because in my life, as I did through meditations, more often than not, you know, my something would come up and bite me in the ass. It would be my emotional immaturity, you know, because a guy, you know, intellect reigns over emotions. At least that's what I was taught. Wow, that was wrong. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, but had to learn that one the hard way. And, and you know, probably still am learning it because, but it is interesting because I do see a lot of patients my age, usually guys, usually white males, who have about the emotional immature, emotional maturity at the at level age twelve or something, and so because they haven't seen this continuum of who we are, one level that we perceive in our body does not rule over the other part of the body. Even most of the doctors that I know who do functional medicine, which is a better version of of the it body, you know, dealing with the physical body, um, they still don't want to delve into the realms of, of, you know, emotions and spirituality and things that you actually have to deal with if you want your patients to get well, is expanding their fields of inquiry. A good doctor gives the, play, the patient just a wider view of a wider toolbox. It isn't just about coming to me and getting an herb instead of a drug while you eat Twinkies, you know. Um, it, it's, it's about, you got to get into why we eat Twinkies because I'm guessing you actually know that Twinkies aren't good for you. Come on, aren't we connecting here? Um, and and there's a reason you get to what do you think the reason is? And then you actually have to get to that. Otherwise, just saying no doesn't work. Okay, kicking us back to the 80s. Um, and so uh, so j just saying no has never worked. Okay, um, to anything. Okay, it's uh, recognizing why we do the things. And and so of course. There's symptom relief is a huge thing. I want to make sure everybody hears that. Um, there's like a lot of anxiety in the world today. And, you know, and, um, you know, my patients, you know, I had somebody the other day, it's like, you know, I, I doubled my antidepressant and, and I thought you'd be mad at me. And I go, well, are you feeling better? <laughs> it's like, and I, no, I feel, I feel much better. Well, there you go. You did just the right thing. That's what so everybody should be doubling their antidepressants these days. That's actually, I'm going to put a newsletter out. Everybody double your antidepressants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but it, it goes something like that, you know, and so because I'm not against medicines because some people aren't at the place yet where they can deal with etiologies, let alone, alone try things that aren't drug like in terms of their effects. And so um, so anybody and, and when you think of holistic medicine, medicine, the medicines are part of the holistic approach to things. They're just, you see a standard Western doctor, you're going in for drugs or surgery, whether you think you are or not. So just make sure you understand if I go to my doctor for back pain, I am actually asking for anti-inflammatories, narcotic, muscle relaxants, maybe a physical therapist if you're lucky, but they will never mention chiropractic massage, anything else that might be acupuncture that might be a more valid approach because it's not part of their belief system. And so, and that gets into the whole thing of Western medicine being coming its own 
own belief system. You guys were talking about some of your experiences with religion. I think in the first podcast, I've never had a strong experience with religion, but trust me very much, everybody, the doctors, especially in the universe, are the high priests of the Western medical belief system, and they're willing to crush out anybody who doesn't believe in what they believe in. And so, so we have to understand it from that standpoint is that most MDs are really just priests of the the Western medical belief system, which is not what I went into medical school for everybody. I thought it was, you know, hard ass science. I, again, if I'm not supposed to discuss it all, Corinne, you know, I'm a little bit colorful oh. in my language. No, that was, that was one of Sean's requirements for wanting to do the podcast. He says, I can't okay. be censored. And I'm like, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Cause I actually am trying to keep it pretty clean as you can probably uh, tell. No, no, uh, we, we've already said yeah, fucking right shit fine. and all that, but in other oh. podcasts, so it's okay, all good. Okay, good. Cause it's yeah. some of the great spiritual words of words of all time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the passion words. Yeah. I, I, I call them passion words. I even, even my, I, my kids correct me all the time and I'm like, no, no, yeah. you, I will teach you when it's the right time to say these words because they're very powerful. But but right now is not that that time for that. It, it, exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yes. Uh, so, um, again, very happy with the course I've been through. But as you were asking earlier, uh, Corinne, yes, I, you know, uh, and I'm sure everybody out there, hopefully everybody in who's listening to this podcast is a meditator. It's the the one practice that I don't let go of. And when I say that, I'm not like Deepak and I've never missed a meditation. I would never tell you that. Um, there's days, especially raising a, a two-year-old where I miss, I, I'm, you know, get up and he's taken care of and he has needs and things like that. So over the last couple of years, I've actually been a little bit worse about my schedule. When I say it that way, as good as I can be given some of the constraints of life, you know? Um, and so, but I take the time for it. I make my practice work that way um and so uh, it's just something so important for everybody if you want to become your own best healer seeing the world exactly as as it is with no manipulation yes i'm stealing from Madhya shanti corinne um the uh <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, again, it's not plagiarism. It's research when you steal from everybody. Remember that, everybody. Right, right, right. So, um, and so, uh, so I do liberally take from everybody. Um, <laughs> anyway, so take so, me to the next place. Okay, so I have a question, actually, because I've known you for many years. And, um, well, first of all, I want to share with everybody that you are known as the Barefoot Doctor in San Luis Obispo because he, he, in the summertime, yeah, there you go. He's pretty much always barefoot. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Sean's a barefoot a lot too, but I wanted to know actually, because I know you had a spiritual teacher that you worked with um, your, when I first met you, what happened, how long did I see your oldest is 28 and he was nine mm -hmm. when I met you. Yes. So we had 20 years we've known each other. Uh, so mm -hmm. You had a spiritual teacher. What mm -hmm. drew you and how did you find her? Why? Like that was, that would to me would be a turning point. Uh, yes. I mean, so the first turning point goes back into what in my life led to like with Deepak. And of course, part of Deepak's draw was his MD in this, right? And be very clear at that point in my life as a guy, I looked at guys as being teachers. And I'm not, I don't know if I consciously thought of it that way, but it became very clear after that. It's like, who did I look, for, who do I respect the most in medical school? And there was one exception, a wonderful doctor in, in Irvine, it was a lady, but man, I am. I am very geared towards white men as being my teachers. That's very interesting. Um, and, and I had noticed that. And then as I was kind of drawing away from Deepak, there was this lady who she's passed now. Okay. And so her name's Miss Dante, Miss Leisha Dante. She's a wonderful, um, she wrote books called Unmanifest Stel Self, Your Fantasies Can Be Hazardous to Your Health, um, that, uh, that she, she she ran across me in my practice and for, you know, uh, uh, up until a few years ago when she passed away, she, I met with her uh, almost weekly for hours at a time. And um, that spiritual psychophysicalness is a term she actually coined um, and I took on as well because I liked the flow of it. But we would do in-depth, and she had a history of psychotherapy, Zen Buddhism, and she combined the two. So to say what we did was very unique, okay? Um, she just kind of took me on as a student, uh, 
um, felt sorry for me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I told her, I, you know, I'm an egomaniacal doctor, and she goes, "Yes, yes, you are." Um, and the, but we can, but we we can work with you. There seems to be little seeds of something here, you know. Um, you know, that, that was, that's as far as any compliments I ever got. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, the Zen system is is much more. Yeah, anyways. Um, but uh, so I got very lucky and, you know, and whether you would call it psychotherapy, it was spiritual psychotherapy, she would actually not want to call it psychotherapy. But she was she's been my best had been my best mentor up until, like I said, a few years ago. And, you know, I, and I think, you know, because basically at the same time, Corinne, um, I had gone to like, I think it was a second or third seduction of spirit. And Deepak pulled me to the side and said, y y you've done this, you, you need to, he actually kind of said, it's time for you to move on, you know, it's like, thanks, dude, I'm paying you a lot of money here. Um, the, <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. Anyways, um, <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> I thought it was very sweet. He said, like, I think you've gotten what you can get from me, you know? And so, so I've been, like I was saying, I, my, I am so lucky in my life in that I, I seem to have found little teachers along the way. And this was a huge one for me. And she kept me on the meditative path. Um, you know, it's like, uh, uh, I have, I've become a path person. Okay. Um, it's, uh, my experience is most people kind of have know where they're going they just need a path, um, and I and as that's kind of the way I see what I do. And again, they can ju jump off the path as many times as they want, but having a path that's been, you know, the well-trodden path is a great thing for people. Um, and and it shows up every. I have paths everywhere in my yard, by the way. It's uh, you know, and and I tend to them. Uh, when I was there, part of the Zen system, I was raking paths for quite length of time. So there's you know, quite a meaning to this path thing um, that uh, just, it, it's entrenched within me in terms of how I see myself in the world, um, let alone as a healer. Um, and so uh, is to just provide paths and of course the guidance and then people heal themselves as we all know. And so, um, but, but man, guidance and a path, wow, that, that helps a lot. <laughs> so you, you mentioned this uh, spirit to psycho, the physical spirit, I, say that one more time spirit to psychophysicalness okay so from spirit to psycho psychological to physical ness is a key thing because ness is the movement okay so spirit, it's a movement of, of the spirit the psyche the physicalness yeah, i think you guys probably and this is so far you know you guys are so far past this but many people come to you think there's a mind body connection and like you get this little aching in your heart where you think oh what a horrible that you could even ask that question you've been taken so far away from reality you know um and that because that's that way people think oh there's beyond a mind it's it's a different reflection of the same you that you have this illusion as you know uh corinne um you know of the physical body the illusion of the mental body etc cetera, etc cetera. but this there is a movement how we perceive things is so important um and so people per, want to perceive their physical body is different their mental body is different their spiritual body and have different techniques for all of them and in the end that's that's loosely true so this movement of this of spirit within psycho within physicalness is a kind of the key to understanding humanity because of course it goes out into the world so when i you know everywhere on the website is like yes the socioeconomic status and where you are raised has a huge part of your health. So you better go out and vote. You better go out and take care of your community because there's somebody in your community, no justice, no peace. I mean, we all are he hearing that, but there, there is, that is a truth, okay? Um, <laughs> that is actually a deep seated truth. And many people have not taken the step towards even anti-racism because they don't realize that there isn't justice out there and how much profoundly it affects them because mm -hmm. they don't have a clear view of, of why they might be unwell. Many of the unwellnesses I see in people right now actually have to do with this collective trauma that we're all facing as a nation, as a world actually, okay? Um, and so um, having a clearer view of why things are that way and how you can take steps, okay? Um, you know, whether that's dealing with service animals or anything else like that, this little part, because can you be well without doing some form of community service? I would propose to you, no. Can you be well without doing some form of spiritual service, etc.? cetera? Um, and so because all of it's part of you and our, our you know, 
whether you, and you were talking about even pre-birth experiences, I think it was uh, uh, Corinne and things like that, where we fit into this continuum of this quantum space-time reality and things like that. So when you see someone who's not well in front of you, there are so many complexities into what's going on there. That's kind of my job to figure some of that out, self out by a whole myriad of things that try to get to the root of things. It's really about trying to get people to see that, that their imbalance is occurring because of, so Corinne, I know you're writing a book. I actually have several in the works as well, but, I know, um, but uh, you know, the, the healing, the platonic model is the good, the true, and the beautiful, right? The th classic three spheres of knowingness, okay? So I try to get people to that level where the good, the true, and the beautiful, by the way, true is physically true. I can measure your vitamin D and you go, I think, I believe I'm taking enough vitamin D wrong system dude we're measuring that shit and i'm going to tell you to take more okay because this is this is a measurement thing it's an objective thing your belief in vitamin d doesn't even mean squat to me i usually don't get that quite a dramatic about it but it goes something like that because d is a measurement thing okay now is love more important than d hell yes okay you can have both though everybody whoo um so take your d and go out and love each other okay it's both okay you know it's different levels. So the true is objective you, okay? And then that's what doctors have been taught to focus on, right? The physical you. And there's a huge push in the world to, to, for doctors not to measure things. They actually measure tests to see if you're diseased or not, not to see if you're well. So even when you go to see the MD, they're doing almost a pathetically bad job of testing your wellness because they don't test for that. They test for diseases, okay? So man, it's good to get a good, objective, true you but then the fun starts, okay? The good, the true, and the beautiful is beauty is in the eye of the beholder or all senses for healing, truthfulness, if you will, not truth, okay? Truthfulness is many people, they are, their, their truth is in music or in art and they're not fulfilling that side of themselves. And even though everybody should feel better when they listen to Sweet Child of Mine from Guns N' Roses, that's actually turns out to not always be true. I, it's weird, okay? Some people, I found out just the other day that Miranda listens to Dwight Yoakam and I went, Dwight Yoakam? Okay, seriously? What? What happened here? I love here? Dwight Yoakam. Well, I figured you might. That's where it kind of was like, Dwight Yoakam? Where did that come from? I'm from Tennessee. Oh, I get it. Um, the, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, what a but when we, this is fantastic. <laughs> but when you heal on this beautiful level, because many people's imbalances occur from a lack of true beauty, and they're not being true to their musical selves, their other beautiful selves, and that's where the problem is. And of course, then when they aren't getting enough, say, touch, okay, they, they eat Twinkies because I want to feel good at some level and they're not dealing with that. So when you deal with this level of the person, spirit, this is more the psycho side of the things, okay, there's so many imbalances in that sphere of, of knowingness that many people will say, well, I'll go to the psychologist for that. But the psychologist is often interested in just kind of uh, when I use psychological mind games, but they actually do a lot of that without getting to some of these really key parts. And then you get to this, you know, so we've covered the good, the beautiful, the true. A lot of people aren't being true to themselves, Dharma, if you will. Okay. So, um, you, know, you know, and so I see people and it was, they don't get well and they're, you know, they'll tell me, I hate living in California. And I go, well, that could be a problem. Um <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there. I hate my wife. Well, there you go. There's another biggie there. Okay. Um, you're not being true to yourself here. So you guys should do some something about that. Oh, and again, they hate their job. I could go on. They're not true to their true dharmic destiny. And it's so sad how far people go down those branches of life. Well, I have to stay in this job because in five years, I'll get a pension or whatever else. What a horrible reason to stay in job. And guys, it might seem weird to you because I know, Corinne, you were saying, like, that's just never been me. I've had my biz own business since, like, what was it, 16 or something? Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, um, but there's so many people who've been kind of down that way or they're in relationships that they're not being truly authentically true themselves. That includes religion, by the way, because there's some people going to church when it doesn't fit, and there's some people they really should be going to church more, but they don't because of some other reason. And so this authentic, so when we heal at the level of the good, the true, and the beautiful, um, you really can get people to have breakthroughs that go beyond just 
here's some naproxen for your back pain or something, you know. Uh, um, and so, and again, not that you can't use occasional medicines for a symptom relief, but um, so when you really look at healing folks, it really comes down to the majority, even if you think your doctor is supposed to handle your healing, which man, there's some funny people who think about that. They think being healthy is getting an annual finger wave. You know, it's like, here you're, you know, I put a finger in your ass and I'll wave it around on your prostate. And yes, you're healthy now. Yes, I have, I have the, the probe of whatever. It's like, come on, dudes. Um, and so there's more to, you know, lubing up my finger and, you know, doing that. So, um, but somehow that's important to them. Okay. But my, man, you, you, my, my rating, sorry to interrupt Gary. My, I, yes. I, I, you know, have really not had health insurance most of my life because I mm-hmm. pay for prevention. And so right. finally, you know, I do now that I'm getting older and when I had married Satya for a while, you know, I had to get health insurance because he had diabetes and stuff. So, you know, I have health insurance this year and I'm, you know, paying, uh, you know, I've got a good deal because of the, the government, um, the Obama, Obamacare. Mm-hmm. So they do this health screening and I'm like, you know, top of the charts for everything. I'm like, I had so totally healthy, no smoking, no, no medication, blah, 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 blah. And it comes to the end of it. And I'm only like 65% out of a hundred because I haven't had a colonoscopy and a mammogram and a, mm-hmm. all that stuff that they right. say I'm not as healthy because I haven't done those things. Right. But everything else is like, I have no stress. I have. So sorry to interrupt, but I was like, just confirm. No, that's okay. Because, yeah, because I was going to just tease you about like, oh, did you already hit Medicare age? Um, <laughs> and that would have been just cruel. I mean, really. Not I mean, yet. you know, uh, not yet. You're not that old because anyways. Um, <laughs> this I'm is, a lot of my patients you. wait until Medicare, until they get some of those things. But you're right. You know, the the, the mo- medicine, the medicine from a standard primary care visit is a checkbox of things. Did you get your flu shot? Oh, they didn't get their flu shot. Ooh, right. bad, but, you know, things like that. Did you get your mammogram? Even though mammograms aren't effective until after 60 in terms of screening, they're useful for diagnostic tests earlier in life, by the way. Um, but colonoscopies, I'm actually am a f- support after 50. Okay. And how old are you again? Well, I'm 57, but my mom's okay. 81 and she's never had one. Oh, yeah, so that, my mom that, and I are that, a lot alike. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the grand rationalization. I meditate uh-huh. so I can learn to rationalize better. Actually, yeah. everybody, just you understand. Um, you know, uh, the, why, why do you meditate? Because I want to come up with more reasons not to get a colonoscopy. Um, the, well, it it no, makes me more well, correct. I mean, let's be honest. It's, you know, right. the less things you can put up your butt. I mean, it seems but, to be a good goal. But, you know, again, actually, when I learned medicine, as I told people, because when I did uh, like some of the Panchakarma from from Deepak, it's like, you know, they're going to put herbal enemas in me. It's like, yeah, no system of medicine says you're supposed to put things come in this way. Then they want to do coffee enemas. Listen, I am drinking a lot of coffee here. OK, so <laughs> I just I got that handled. I just want you to know you don't have to put it up, you know, up the butt. And so actually a funny story out of a patient of mine. He has a, a, a coffee roaster called Top Dog. And I said, listen, there's a whole market for you. It's coffee enemas. You should make underdog. Um, <laughs> um, he st- and and he still hasn't done it. I, I keep uh, on about every year. It's like, dude, underdog. Come on, this has got to work. We could we could market this. Okay, I can have a whole thing with an enema bag with underdog. It, it would work. Um, anyways, <laughs> so going back to what you're saying, most doctors, that's a checkbox. And if your cholesterol is over 200 and you're not on a statin, they actually will lose within their system. The pediatricians will lose money if they don't give it the kids the vaccines, etc. So yes, there is a grand illusion um that's another sticks reference for everybody um the uh, there's a grand illusion in medicine that these are the things are right and the proven things to do um so you're right corinne the the but what real wellness if you were doing functional medicine testing you would have a hemoglobin a1c and an insulin level done you'd have a vitamin d level done you'd have inflammatory markers you'd have other things to confirm to you are you as well as you feel? Because wellness is the first and most important thing I look for for people is how are you guys feeling? And most people don't tell you the truth. They say, I'm feeling fine because that's what I say to everybody. Um, and that's, that's great. Um, but then you bring in all their tests and then you show them these are some of the weaknesses that you have that would predict long-term health or healing or lack thereof, of course, okay? Um, so what most Western medicine uh, doctors call preventive medicine is really early detection medicine. So so mammograms are not 
their early detection medicine, they are not preventive medicine, folks. Okay, they're about finding cancers earlier, not preventing them. Okay, that very same doctors who will do that while still prescribing women, you know, unbalanced estrogen to progesterone prescriptions and causing cancer, and then finding it earlier with the mammogram that they for the cancer that they caused, and they think they're doing a good job. That's actually not true. Um, and so, so, so true preventive medicine for the breast is actually having organic lifestyle, cutting out the aluminum out of your skincare products, et cetera. It, you know, it goes on and on, uh, correcting vitamin D levels, decreasing inflammation. That's prevention, okay? Um, mammograms are early detection. You know, uh, there, there's so many cases um, earlier and earlier in life of, of colon cancer. I'm still going to recommend you get a colon cancer screening. Sorry, Corinne. Um, you know, um, it was really, t I did one. I, my plan is I did one at about 50, 51. I have to, I tell my patients age 50, so I really did get it by 51. So I'm not too much of a hypocrite. I'm 57, everybody. And so uh, so I got it by age 51. I plan on getting another one at about 60, 61. And if I have two colonoscopies that are completely clear, fortunately, my first one was completely clear, no polyps, and I get another one at 60, two, two colonoscopies in my lifetime, I hope, um, if I have no polyps, that is. Um, and then I'm done screening because by then I've picked up on, on environmental toxins, other types of things, my lifestyle up to that point, um, which wasn't pure and pristine when I was in my 20s. Um, and so I picked up on some things and then then I don't think I need to do anymore. And then there's a test called cardiac calcium score that you really should get, Corinne. Every woman over 55, coronary artery disease is absolutely ascertainable by a thing called the coronary calcium score, which just in the last year seems to be covered by insurance as well, which is a ultra fast CAT scan of the coronary artery to see if you're developing placking. And that's another super reassuring thing that you, let's say you have a cholesterol of 250 or something. I'm not saying you do, Corinne, but let's say you did. Mine's 185 consistently okay. because I'm, I'm, I'm high in my family. Okay, so 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 it's 185. There's still some doctors, ooh, that's still kind of high, which is oh, not true. Tried. I know, I, I okay. knew that. I told them, I'm like, no. Okay. Okay, and they'll still want to check off a box that you're on a statin because there's a certain belief system in Western medicine. Everybody should be on a statin. They should be in the water along with the Prozac, you know? Um, just balances everything. Um, and so, so, but there's kind of screening tests to reassure you um, that you really are as doing as well with whatever your diet is. So like, for instance, I see so many people, you know, the, the basic truth of nutrition is nutrition treats people, not diseases, okay? So even though I'm a huge nutrition-oriented physician, um, every single person is unique and therefore needs different nutrition, okay? So, and the biggest, the saddest thing they come to me is they're trying to lower their cholesterol when most of the times they shouldn't be trying to lower their cholesterol. Or they ask me, how do I treat for my heart disease or my cancer? And they've lost themselves as a human being. They've been befuddled by, by the Western medical system to thinking they're a disease who so happens to have a human, not a human who happens to have a disease, okay? Um, and so, and so if you believe, and like I said, when you, I'm a, a paleo doctor, paleo just means paleolithic, meaning humans, you should eat real food. You should eat like a human, which is an omnivore. Okay. Um, and within that omnivore, it does allow for vegans and all the way to carnivores, by the way, but you're not supposed to become a carnivore because you read somebody's blog site that says carnivorism is great because you will find that by the way. Um, and so, um, but if like say over a course of time, every time you ate any form of plant product, you felt horrible. And anytime you ate meat, you felt well, it's extremely rare. I'm not, I'm not saying it never exists, but it's really rare. Then you can become a carnivore because your body told you, not because you believe it, okay? The same thing goes for veganism though, by the way, um, is that people are eating a belief system. They'll come to me as a vegan. They look horrible. They feel horrible. Um, and you show them their labs and I go, but I, you know, th this vegan thing is not working for you. Can we please not eat a belief system? You know, um, <laughs> it's not the way to go. Um, belief systems are for the intangible. We're kind of taking us back to the true thing. We should really use science for this whole nutrition thing. Um, and so, uh, so it's a very, very important thing that because um, you really do when you get into most people's nutrition, you tell an Italian to take away their pasta, you just better be ready for some fisticuffs. Um, that's um, like, that's you know. like telling an Indian not, like Satya who has yes. diabetes not right. to eat rice. Yes. He's, he's still eating rice. Right. And that's not 
smart. It, not that he's not a smart person, but once again, I'm just saying that actual that one action of eating a lot of rice when you're diabetic is just not good good practice. And so that's a truth. Whether it's you know brings certain joy. It's funny. I had a lady this last couple of weeks ago. I'm Japanese and I just need to eat rice. I'm Japanese. She had the same rationalizations about you not getting a colonoscopy. It's it's in my blood. It's in my <laughs> genetics. I need the rice. And she's like gain like weight like this, and you know her blood levels are horrible. Like I think you get a little too much rice here. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of objective data that maybe we should back off on the rice a little bit. Um, and so, um, so that's where the data points come in because people are, it's unfortunate because I wish they would go with intuition. I wish they would go with their true heart, their meditative silent self, because it's telling them where to go so often in their lives. Right. Um, and they can be the same thing with nutrition. If they just set, they have to settle themselves down first of all. Um, well, their so. bodies and their lives are trying to tell them. Yes. That's they're exactly speaking what to I'm... them really loudly and clearly, and they're just right. not listening. Right. And that's, that's what people just don't, you know, it's like, and, and everybody's pain threshold is different. Like everybody's bottom is different. Right. And right. so until they make the changes, until they feel enough pain that they will finally, you know, right. make the different, the changes. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and that's, you know, you mentioned intuition and I, uh, mm -hmm. right now is, well, I'm, I'm, so I'm 34 and, you know, it's been about a decade of, uh, since I met Corinne and, you know, started this process of um, gaining discernment on how to trust and how to even navigate what intuition is and how to use it effectively. And and that's that's something that I think is interesting about, you know, belief systems is my generation, probably the generation, you know, below me, there's not a lot of conversations that I'm hearing, uh, even as my kids are in school, about how to even use intuition or there's there is no talk about intuition or bringing intuition into your life because that intuition in and of itself seems to challenge the status quo of a system of whatever system you know we talked about you know spiritual religion and you 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 discuss you know uh scientific dogma or medical dogma and it it it's interesting how cemented you can become into a system even when your intuition creates a stress response in your body that starts to cause many, many problems. And you, you, it seems like the, the programming is, well, then go back into the system to solve that problem. Don't follow intuition. Don't look outside the system. Dive right back into the system and, and try to fix it from a system that caused you to have this problem in the first place. Right. You can't create problems with the same thinking that got you into the problem, right, is what you're saying. And that's what's happening is that, you know, I do think, you know, it's the um, the generations as I see them, you get, well, of course, I think there's a lot of stress in the world. I, I thought it was so interesting, Corinne, you asked me to do this, and even on the, on the eve of what I consider to be a huge hopeful inflection point towards something and turning point in terms of how we see the world. And just as a, a background, I, you know, if, um, you know, I do have two sons who are 27 and 28, and I have my two-year-old at home, which is a very fascinating experience in and of itself in terms of how I am raising those kids. I did the best I could 27, 28 years ago, but am I a different dad now? And the answer is yes, okay? Um, and so, but the thing that I've noticed is really, my, I really am very clear that from 1980 to 2020, this 40-year point to get we're getting to this turning point where we really have cut descended down some dark times and as i joked with people from trickle down economics to p-tapes it's just a perfect ending see the bookends right folks you know p-tape trickle down economics see it just comes together so perfectly i don't know what okay. p-tape is I, explain the, the, the p-tapes donald trump and the p-tapes come on the, the russians have stuff on him because he oh, pees okay. on people or he likes watching you know so so okay, so we have urine on both sides okay golden showers okay so trickle down economics p-tapes so i again i didn't write this this is just the way it is um and so, so we know that this is the the beginning and the ending uh 
sorry. Um, but I, my son is named Leonardo for that reason. There's a shift, there is a shift happening right now and a shift in awareness that had to occur for humans to survive. And we went to from 80 trickle down economics. And to be clear too, at the beginning of my career was the start of the HIV career, HIV thing. And that was a terrific part of my training was dealing with young men, especially who were just dying in the hospital with no hope. And they weren't really being recognized and the, the evangelicals were coming down on them and they're often dying alone and, and it wasn't being recognized by Reagan until almost how many years it took him to do that and the horror of that and then look at the end of now we're dealing with another kind of pandemic a different kind of virus but the same kind of concept so much pain and suffering caused um, that's happening in the bookends of this time so I sincerely believe and I could be wrong that there's a shift that's occurring in awareness, including that started with your the generations, okay? Um, my son, if he's going to have any chance, the two-year-old, of having any world, we have to make a shift, okay? Um, and so, and I do think we will, because we have to, actually. Um, and so, so I'm very hopeful for that. But I do see that each generation at least less willing to um, live that life of nine to five in a cubicle and all that other stuff. They've gotten past a lot of the, the ideas that we brought down that I grew up with, that you're supposed to work so hard and do these things and it was fair out there and all this other stuff. So I've seen shifts occurring, but I see a much more dramatic shift. I'm hoping even for my little Leo, that he's part of a world that's just far more loving kindness. That's what their basis is, not greed is good. Cause you know, eighties was greed is good, right? Um, and so, uh, and it never was everybody. Um, and so ever, okay, even if what's his name, uh, one of the Douglas guys said it. Um, anyways, it was the Wall Street movie. I, I like my film references, but that one's just not coming. Um, anyways, the <laughs> so so uh, you know, but yes, our whole culture went down this dark, dark pathway, and look where we're at right now. Um, and I do see a sign. Everybody voting that we're turning away from that. And with that will come this cultural shift all the way, not within our lifetimes, mind you, the steps occur now, but you know, well past maybe your lifetime, certainly not Corinne's. We've established how old she is. Um, the, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. I, I actually did know Corinne everybody when she was young. Um, and so, <laughs> so by the way, uh, so, so I'm, I'm going to cut, I'm gonna cut yes. you off for a second. So thank you. She, she actually prepped me. Um, and said, yeah, he's, he's probably going to give me a ton of shit, uh, during this podcast. So I was prepared for this and, oh, good. and I said, well, mm -hmm. I will join him, but it'll all be from love, obviously. And I said, but it will also come from, uh, pure vengeance and retaliation because a few weeks ago, uh, uh, I, I tripped mushrooms with, with Corinne, um, and I took a rather high dose and I had an incredibly humbling experience of seeing my own bullshit, my my uh, my, my spiral out of my story and my my own bullshit and how full of shit I was, and, right. and uh, she basically got to sit there for three hours and just watch me spiral out and laugh at me constantly. Right. So she's got this very you know. So please, okay. by all means, so that's okay because we've established that she does need to have a tube shoved up her ass, and just <laughs> just every time she actually comes back at you, hey, have you had your colonoscopy? <laughs> just just have that back there because you know it's always good to have a few more pieces of material, but you got yeah. that one, okay? Absolutely. She needs a colonoscopy. She needs somebody to actually look up her colon, okay, to make sure that you know nothing's wrong going on there. Um, the <laughs> Do I get any good drugs? <laughs> Yeah, they do. They give you some nice drugs at the time. So it's actually you barely remember any of it, you know, so it's the worst um, part is the drinking the thing. My sister told me about drinking. Mm -hmm. That's I don't know if I can get it down. I honestly don't like, you I, know, I have a I, really hard time drinking. I'm, I'm sorry. I've, I've had actually much worse experiences actually in India. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dude, no. I, I don't want to hear shit from you. Ha, 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 ha. Um, and so, what, what's up with this bidet thing? You want me to hose my ass? What's going on with this, okay? By the end, it was nothing but the hose in my ass because, of, wow. Um, okay, we have to tell that story then since you referenced it. We can't leave everybody hanging on that. And I actually prefaced Sean with it because Sean heard about it a year ago when it happened. My right. good friend Gary has been wanting to come to India for 20 years and talking about it, has not taken two weeks off in his life since he was 17, since before medical right. school, and has come to India. He lands. We have a day and a half, two days, 
And then I go knock on his door. Gary is, uh, and he was sick for the next 10 days. Yeah. He could not leave his room for at least six or seven days. Oh, we left. I mean, we did our little things in the area and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But as, but yeah, it was, it's with, with close, you know, to the, to the room and things like that. So you did take, you took great care of me. I, I want to make sure everybody hears that. So she came by and it's like, uh, man, I was like the first night I had the fevers and things like that too, man. I had some, it wasn't quite as fun as your mushroom experience, but you know, it was <laughs> something in that area. It says getting up is very tough to do. Um, and so, but I, that being stated, I loved it there. And like one of the things that the Werner was talking about was just, there is there is such a cacophony when you get there the honking of the horns and everything else like that that's off you know it it never it was like wow this is a lot louder than i expected i expected a lot of people noise but i didn't actually see all the honking that was started at like as soon as the sun rises and things and then as soon as you settle into your meditation by our notchula especially this isn't a true anomaly and and yeah, uh, yeah, anyways and so um you, there's just such a background beauty that all that stuff just doesn't matter. Um, and so, and that's the, the something that you tie into. So it made me slow down. So when you get an illness like this, um, it's also to make you slow down. So we were gonna, we got to do some hikes. We got to go to see a few of the caves and things like that. We got to have the, some experiences, but I probably got exactly what I needed um, yeah. When I was when I was going through that, because I was spent more time in silence, etc. Not like twenty years, like the last dude. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, but uh, but I, you know, it was, it was actually a very wonderful experience, and of course, time with the kids and everything else. But um, so I love my time in, in India. It's the longest I've been away, um, it, you know, in my life, and so uh, and it was beautiful. Um, at the very same time as like you know, lightning's coming out of my ass, um, and so you know. <laughs> Uh, but I had a hose, you know, it's like, what's There's up with that? Hose. There's, there was a hose right there. So when the lightning was coming out, I could hose it right down. It was, it was, it was balance in the universe. I believe that's what they mean by that. Lightning coming out, your ass, you got a day, bam. Um, so you didn't that, what's up with that? What's that? You didn't suffer unnecessarily. You no, suffered. no. Just, yeah, no, nah, it's oh. it was part of the it was part of the process, and so it was a rite um, of passage. So if, since she she had invited me to there, and that happened to me, I'm sure you I should be part of your you know getting your your go lightly or whatever your your doctor gives you. And yes, the overnight prep was actually nothing compared to what. The, <laughs> So um, the prep is worse than the procedure. Please, everybody, this, I did see a lady once who had allowed herself to have rectal bleeding for two years. And she came to see me because I was a holistic doctor. And it's like, why waiting two years? And her rationalization, she was a vegan and she meditated. This couldn't be anything serious. Unfortunately, it was something very serious. And I don't even know if we could have helped her two years ago, but there was not much time left by the time I could see her, you know? Um, and I'm not trying to be too dramatic. I, it just, it's, we saw the same thing with Chadwick Boseman. We've seen this other things. It's just, this is one thing where it's a, such a toxic world out there, everybody. Colon cancer screening is an imperative. It's every 10 years after 50, do a colonoscopy. That is a screening earlier if there's a family history. So the family history thing ended at 50 for Corinne. Um, that excuse just left. Um, um, and then, then you have to check in because of the, the toxicity of our world, everybody. It's just, it's, it's overwhelming to think of how many chemicals are in our environment now that weren't there even 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. That's why some of the toxin-related cancers. So breast cancer screening, breast, the single best predictor for breast cancer is actually this, there's a test that they do in Europe, which is basically total xenoestrogen load. Xenoestrogens are all the chemicals in the cosmetics and everything else like that. So it's kind of this great um, farcical thing that we've convinced women that their estrogens cause cancer. And it's the xenoestrogens, the chemicals in the environment, interacting with the estrogen receptors that are supposed to be in their breasts, by the way, and everywhere else. Um, and that's what's causing the cancers. It's not your estrogens. It's another misogynistic Western medical thing to make women believe their hormones supposedly are causing cancers. It's not their hormones. It's what we're giving to them and are, is in the environment. So that's, that's why even though we do all of our practices it's wise to do screening. It's wise to get with a functional medicine doctor to do tests that are different than early detection medicine. They're really about really finding, am I functioning as well as I think I am kind of medicine? And that's where the functional medicine doctors come in. 
of course your meditative life is more important. Of course your spiritual and your dharmic life is more important. But this kind of goes into this lines of intelligence thing where, yes, we need to work on our love line of intelligence, our music line of intelligence, everything. To be healthy as a human being, it's really a lot of things. Western medicine comes in to pick up on disease states. That's what they're meant to do. Um, the colonoscopy is meant to pick up on hopefully polyps, not cancer, okay? Um, the breast cancer screening, the mammography is more about picking up on early cancers as compared to later cancers. There's value to them. And I can encourage people enough, it's especially useful in people who take care of themselves, not the Coke people, seriously, the Coca-Cola people. <laughs> um, and so, no, uh, since we're doing drug references. By the way, it was a quick, just one quick funny story. I was, I got a gift in my office just the other day. And so, and I love my patients. So, and it was basically a big dark chocolate bar, but it was the whole message that came in this world and things like that. It's perfectly microdose psilocybin in each square. Uh, it's like, thank you. My, my patients are giving me illegal drugs. I love them. That's um, awesome. And, uh, that and so is I just, awesome. I figured you needed a little microdosing, you know, and she was probably correct. I have not partaken of it yet. So it was, it was just like a, a couple of days ago. Um, but isn't that nice? Because, and that's another thing too, people, by the way, is that the so much misinformation about psychedelics and they were misused. There's potential use for all of them. Um, you know, the, uh, so including psilocybin, which is one of the psychedelics and that's a, its own conversation. But, um, but this journey of healing for everybody really is about that. Wow. And that's another thing when we see the problems with insurance and things like that, we're all supposed to be our own best healer. Having some guidance is a really good idea. Remember I talked about paths and guidance, but in the end, it's about you guys tuning to yourself and go, wow, I'm an omnivore and I tend to eat more meat. Oh, meat's bad for me. But if it, if that's right for you because you feel well and maybe get some lab tests too, then that could be right for you. I'm more of a vegan and I feel better that way. Please listen to that. Good yeah. heavens. Okay. Um, um, but you know, so, but there's, there's too many belief systems and very little actual knowledge going out there. You know, they were talking about this war on Christmas that never existed and so Melania Trump, by the way. Um, the, <laughs> um, um, so all the people who are talking about the war on Christmas brought in somebody who really is actually warring against it. Um, and then the same time, they warred on science, okay? So we saw this, you know, right now where the doctors are being damnified for this coronavirus thing and we're the ones out there. I'm, I'm the one with on the friends front. out there on the front lines. We are dying and trying to protect people and they are blaming us for it you know, know yes so that sad. chaps my ass a little bit you know and so yeah. um uh and yes it's more personal for me of course okay because we're 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 part of that we even had a patient not too long ago a, a, a right-wing person who walked into the office with symptoms and it's like you know dude you know you know, this is a real thing, you yeah. know? Um, and so, so there has been a war on science and a war on knowledge, actually, because that's the whole idea. You guys brought up this thing. What, what gets you out of religion? Questioning, right? Yeah. Um, what gets you uh, on the dark side of Western medicine? Question, I promise you, that doesn't get you on the in crowd with the Western doctors, okay? <laughs> um, and so... Uh, the and and it's because you're challenging their belief systems you really are and that's a good thing to do but remember it comes as it's a turbulent pathway for all of us you know um why do most people not take it they'd rather actually um i do netflix or something you know I, it's and i understand that but it's kind of like whichever pill you choose in, in the matrix, you know, they, they're choosing the one to get plugged back in. And so we all got to choose the pill where we go into reality. And that's why I think it's a great metaphor in that movie, you know, um, is to really dive into it. Is it easier to dive into reality? No, it's, it's, a, it's quite the adventure actually. Um, and so, uh, um, but as a doctor that, that's been practicing for a long time now, yes, everybody, I think we've established I'm even older than Corinne. Um, a couple uh, of months, I think. <laughs> just a couple yeah and so but you know um and so but doing this a long time and so uh the the i look forward to so much to medicine beginning to evolve again and to bring back in all the principles we're talking about um i consider middle path medicine i talked with my, my the guru that i've had for so many years and she said that's I like that. You know, I, I had this, the older business uh, um, called the Blissful Dragon Wellness Center. Very cool one, by the way. She wasn't very hip on that one. Um, then I had a, a natural balance wellness center and she just kind of looked at me again. But when I did middle path medicine, she goes, that's a movement and consciousness you're part of. Okay. And just make sure you see it that way. Cause this is just something you are part of. Um, and so 
Um, and it's been very interesting, even the World Health Organization used the term middle path in terms of dealing with this virus and other things. So we're seeing that. And even though we think of it as a Buddhist term, it, it's really not. It's just an expression of reality that there's been so many forces for so long trying to take us during one side or the other. And there is a path. There's a path we can all take to wellness. And it should be fun too, by the way. That's another part of this. So um, food actually can be fun without making it sweets and things like that. The meditative practice, although early on seems difficult for people, is something you would not live without, <laughs> um, especially in today's world. And, um, and so, and all these things make your life so much richer and so much fuller. It doesn't mean you won't get diseases. It doesn't mean you won't get illnesses. It's just not true. You'll get these things, but you'll see them for what they are as little markers along the pathway. And so, um, and so, and that's the beauty of, of real healing is that you recognize even as diseases as part of it. Um, in today's world, I talk about the coronavirus. I'm a little bit geeky. I love infectious disease. Okay. So, um, and so when it comes to coronavirus and what it might, again, there's a lot of potential negatives. The first and most important thing is the concept of the terrain being everything, the organism, nothing. You take care of yourselves. You just don't have to have the degree of fear that people have over this virus. I respect it, but good heavens, you know, get some more exercise in, turn to a whole food diet. You will take some vitamin D, some melatonin if you're over 50. There's a lot of things you can do, and it'll be just another – because look at that. They're a little RNA virus, a little pocket of energy and information that is part of God, the universe, whatever, that comes in to educate you and make you a healthier person. That's what a virus is. So the degree of fear that people have over infectious disease is so overblown so that we can make you so afraid that everything's about antibiotics or vaccines, which is a complete misinformation to make you too afraid. Are there a time and a place for an antibiotic? Yes. And for a vaccine? Yes. Not to the degree that we do it. And then when you wake up to that, because look at what's happening. There's no, no vaccine to sell you, no drug really to sell you at this point. So that we're kind of floundering because our system is, has gone so far away from true healing. You know? And so um, what a great lesson for the world that this virus is. Now, that sounds crass and cruel because people are dying out there. I already told you that, that I'm concerned that we've had a war on science, but the science would have taken us in a much different direction as a country um, if we just listened to it. Um, and so, so I'm so hopeful as 2020 rolls around and we have, and, and I consider the current um, election to be a step in the right direction and damn, we can maybe celebrate for a day or two and then, then the real work is to right. be done. Okay. Well, um, that, and that's so it's interesting that you, you brought up, you know, what, wellness that it, I've heard this on a few different podcasts talking about uh, uh, the virus is you know there's there's so much fear to to sell there's mm -hmm. so much death or uh, you know how many how many people are actually getting it and the you know the tests are now up et cetera et cetera there's so much information about that and and there really isn't a lot of information even from doctors on what you just what you just said which is if you have a healthy system, the fear that you have for this can be diminished dramatically. And, and that's a great way to put it because you're not saying if you have a healthy system, you can't get this and you're not going to be ill. That's not what you said. Right. What you're saying is your fear of it can be less. Mm -hmm. right. and, and and it sounds like what a, a big proponent of, of your practice is integration of you, you got to have a spiritual practice. You, you have to have a, a psychological practice, you know, you, which is focusing on your emotions. What's your emotional state? What is your psycho? What is the psychology of your system that you live in? And then, what is your physical body telling you? You know, it's an integration of all these three things. And, you know, in, in spe specific to the virus, uh, if you have a meditation practice, if you have that spiritual, you're probably sh your, your stress is probably lower. Uh, if if your psychology is in check, if you have uh, a, a strong support system around you, emotional support system, your stress is going to be lower. And if you are taking care of your body, your physical system is going to be less uh, responsive in a negative way to a virus. Again, like you said, it doesn't mean you're clear forever or you're never going to have any you know, problems with it. But having a full integrated healthy system in your life is going to make you 
or is going to allow you to take these viruses in. And, and that could be a psychological virus or a spiritual virus or anything that happens in your life. And you're going to take it in as what you said, is, which is information. And that's a really great way to put it is, yes, it's a struggle for a moment, but it's just for a moment. You take it in, you right. learn from it, and then you're stronger because of it. Exactly. That's perfectly said. Um, and so because that's the whole point is that we, you know, the toughest things I've been through medical schools, I mean, they're hard. OK, I mean, and so a virus can be hard on you, but that's actually kind of the point is, you know, the old saying is if it doesn't kill me, it only makes me stronger. The key first part is, you know, don't kill you. Um, and so and there's a few things out there. I mean, that, you know, you'd, you would want to not ever get. But that's extraordinarily rare in the organism world, like the anthraxes and things like that. It's like, oh. I'm just going to be healthy and run over and get some anthrax. Actually, I actually advise against that approach. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but wait a minute, I meditated today. Yeah, still wouldn't take on the anthrax. It's, it's just, you know, come on, you know, it's a, but there's a very, very few things that are really quite like that. Um, and so, so most of these viruses, you know, so for instance, it's a big thing because for instance, I have a two and a half year old um, and he still hasn't gotten a vaccine. I don't know when he will because I'm not afraid of the organisms that they're vaccinating against. Um, and uh, the, and, and, you know, and that doesn't mean that what I'm doing is right. I'm not saying everybody should do what I'm doing, but I'm not going to do an injection of a drug, which vaccines really are drug, but that's its own conversation. Um, that when a healthy kid, when I know their body, because he's been on probiotics since birth and he's been on vitamin D since birth, et cetera, and immune system supports and things like that, and he's super healthy, then he's faced infections that he can, none of the things that they're vaccinating against. Now, that's one thing like tetanus. I would consider one day doing a single tetanus toxoid because that's a kind of infection you really don't want to have, okay? Um, but that would be to protect him, not the world, okay? And so, so bit by bit, we have to look at these and make individual decisions for ourselves about this because I'm honestly not afraid of the other infections because I don't have to be because if I take care of him he would could get measles and be well um, and so um, the and or whatever else you want to think about um, and so so it is interesting to think the degree of fear that people are that's being sold because that's what you see if you middle path just like the whole coronavirus thing it really is on the left so much fear people said i'm not going to leave my home until there's a vaccine oh that's tragically sad to me. It really is. Okay, there's there are people like that, believe it or not. And so, um, and then there's the other side of things. It's a hoax, and they're going to super spreader events. We there there is a there's a huge. I think there's a lot of room in between those. I really do. Um, and so, um, <laughs> I think we can find something, you know. Um, and so, uh, and and really, the the mask is everybody understands from this, especially more the East. That the mask is about mutual respect. It's really, it's, that's what it is. You're doing this out of respect for the other, uh, you know? And so, um, and so it's, it's, and it does work, by the way, the science is, is uh, unequivocally clear that it decreases the rate of infection. Um, and so, and it decreases the viral load. That's the other part of it. I mean, maybe it's only 50 to 70% effective at uh, preventing the infection, but might decrease mortality and hospitalizations by 70, 90% yeah. because you're getting less of a viral load. Okay. And you're not sharing it with other people that don't want it to be and taking it to people who are unhealthy. So it's masks and mutual respect. Social distancing is pretty straightforward. These are kind of common courtesy things that we do that are part of public health that would keep us from shutting down our economy again, which I hope we don't do because we don't really need to do that far um, if everybody did these things. And the key is the everybody part of it. And can we get people together to see that this is just about kindness and mutual respect? Um, you know, your personal freedom is infringed every day. I can't rock out with my cock out. Damn it. You know? Um, and so, um, so every day I have to put on pants, you know, I just, you know, I, I wouldn't just be barefoot. I'd be freaking naked. Um, and so that's uh, a great point. I'm sorry. That is a know? really great point. I don't mean to cut you off, but <laughs> you know, th that is a, such a big conversation is like, well, I don't mm -hmm. want my personal freedoms infringed on. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, you, you can't exist in a society w where all of your personal freedoms are held in intact. Exactly. Right. That. I, you know, if you're a nudist colony, you, you cannot go into society mm -hmm. naked. Right. I'm sorry that that's a challenge to your personal freedom, and right. now that's not to say that th that your personal freedoms can't be taken advantage of. Of course, that can right. happen too. You know, it's right, this right. middle path conversation that I, I don't know mm -hmm. that we're having 
which is which is actually really funny. And the mask thing is a great point. It's mm-hmm. well, if the masks don't cure the disease, fuck the masks. It's like, well, no, yeah. that is not. That's not what we're doing here. We're we're we're, we're compromising I- 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 these integral steps to mm-hmm. to to deal with this problem as a collective. Right. When we don't have a solution just yet, or or a cure, or a vaccine, or et cetera, et cetera, but but doing nothing doesn't do anything, and going to the extreme of doing nothing and staying in your home is also not a good thing. You're you're talking. No. We, we live in these extremes uh, in, right. in all aspects of our life, and and then we wonder why the Western medical field can't cure us of all these diseases. It's like, well, you're not participating in your own cure and being a part of your own cure. Mm-hmm. So why would you expect an outside source to just be able to magically, you know, m- right. make your cures go away? So I'm sorry, I just, that was a beautiful way. You know, it's like, right. y- you don't have complete full freedom. It's, no. and that's okay. You we, know. we don't, you know? And so, um, and so we do these things out of, you know, kind of our mutual interconnectedness because yeah. no the idea that you really are even though you seem so separate from me that there, there is a deeper truth that that's just not true and so um and there's at some level where it is and so so the why wouldn't i have the same kindness and respect for you that i have for myself okay and so and that and it's a very simple conversation at that point and then it's like okay yes and and good i have science backing me up that's a good thing too in terms of wearing the mask etc and so so this stuff is really actually about this the seeing each other and the, that's where the spirituality comes in because once you really have a true grasp that that everybody it's like when um you know i was going to use a trump reference but if you look at the we all are dealing with our shadow stuff i've had a lot of shadow work that i've done and inner child work and blah 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 you know and so um but y- you have to deal with these things and th- is our country dealing with a collective shadow yes okay um and is this a good time for you to deal with our, your own shadow work and and the answer is yes and so um, i had a, a person the other day she's like trump is the first person i've ever hated and i go you're way ahead of the rest of us okay because wow okay because good for you because she's about our age it's like oh no i i've been down that road before um so so no he's and i i've gotten you know but and we had part of the conversation was is that of course i wouldn't take the energy to hate the man i mean do i agree with his policies etc etc i mean no i mean do i look for a better thing but why would i commit the energy to hate that person so when he was sick you know i had a lot of friends like you know you know you think he should you know he, he should die and i go i i don't orchestrate outcomes that's one big thing i've ever understood i have such a tiny viewpoint in this world can i see a world where hundreds of thousands of people might be saved if he passed on i can see that do i know that that's the best outcome i really don't um so so what do you do you just i hope for, i hope and pray for the best outcome that's all i ever do not knowing what it is and so um and so one of the beauties of this is he let's say he did get the virus and that he did recover from it but the the things you saw him get included vitamin d vitamin c melatonin i think those things and the dexamethasone these are all things that i I think are breakthroughs in therapy are what made the difference not the high price drugs that got touted afterwards that was a sales pitch okay um so did we see that the somebody who was pretty unhealthy get the virus and live through it that is a should be a great sign. That's one thing I agree with him. Should everybody living be living in fear of this virus? No, I am in complete agreement with that statement. We should not be living in fear of this virus. Um, but respecting it, well, that's a different story. Yes. And so, um, but what a great learning time point for everybody. And, and infectious diseases have been around for a long time and you've been used to manip- manipulate people forever. Um, and so how do you really deal with this problem? Let's see, that's um, deal with income inequality and sanitation and get the lead out of the pipes. And there are so many things that would work better than a freaking vaccine. That little moment where Redfield, the director of the CDC, had a little window of honesty. He actually made a point, even when the vaccine came out, I really think he pulled out and said the mask. I think the mask is still going to be more effective than this vaccine. Wow. Um, and so that was a pretty key moment for everybody that seemed to just wash away with time, which he's telling you, you know, you're looking at these things. But back to the geeky side about that, there's RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines. There's entirely new technologies that are going to come to the fore because of this trauma. So it, is that can lead to advancements in science? Yes. 
The flip side of things is we have completely new technologies, zero liability for any complications, and hundreds of billions of dollars to, to be made in it. Let's warp speed this stuff. Um, wow, if there was ever a recipe for disaster, you pretty much created it, okay? <laughs> you know, um, so that's why everybody, when they talk about, like, when a vaccine comes out, will you do it? It's like, we all need to evaluate why it came out and what is the science behind it, what the percent of efficacy is, what my personal mortality rate and complication rate is from that virus, and is that vaccine better than that? That's a fairly nuanced conversation that nobody seems to want to have. You're either with us or you're Guinness, you know, and sorry. Um, that was a little Bush moment for you. Um, the uh, um, <laughs> mission accomplished. Um, the uh, <laughs> sorry. And, and, no, no, you and then that's just yeah. to, to show the, you know kind of what you said is we are at a shift. We are at a societal shift. We're yeah. at a turning point. Uh, not to keep throwing that out there, but right. that's what it's called. And you know, mm -hmm. it's interesting that this this conversation really between Corinne and I, you know, it spawned from her book, and it was just kind of felt natural to talk about this because. It feels like there is an awakening, awakened consciousness to that fact that, wow, these things on a societal level are not simple conversations. Sometimes there's simple, you know, solutions like, okay, just have the respect of wearing a mask. That's a simple solution. Okay. But, but the whole of it all is way more complex and and you, when you're dealing with the belief structures of this group and the belief structures of this group and the emotional of this group and the emotional state of this group and, and the physical health of et cetera, et cetera, you know, you, you start breaking this thing down. And fortunately, I have I've heard a lot of conversations through podcasts, uh, through a lot of people that are, you know, kind of in our communities, you know, have a lot of that like, man. I just don't know if there's a simple solution. We need to start having these conversations on a very deep, open, and honest level um, because we are seeing uh, the shadow side, and the shadow side could be past things that we thought we were over or that we thought we uh, you know, maybe healed from. But, but there's a large part of our community in this country that have not healed or are still being wounded or damaged by the residuals of, of some of this, uh, these, these activities that have happened in our society. And, and it's, it's amazing how many people want to point the finger at, well, no, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or this is, this is, this is like the cause. It's like, why don't we talk about it? Why don't we have these conversations and these really right. hard conversations and these, these dark conversations about, and be honest, uh, Mm -hmm. about our involvement in these things and then see what we find. But sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second, but it's like, you know, we, we really need to have these nuanced conversations in a deep right. way. I have had patients in my practice who were never had anxiety and depression, and I'm seeing an overwhelming amount of anxiety and depression in my practice, okay? And that's a lot to do. It's the coronavirus. It's the turbulence in the world. I've had patients who had anxiety and depression who are having psychotic breaks, okay? Um, Heck, my wife, who just has anxiety, she's uh, like talking to dead people now. I mean, you know, what? Are, what's up with that? I mean, so, um, <laughs> you know, uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine visited her out of nowhere. Who's Denise? What are you talking about? Um, you know, it's like shit's happening, folks. Um, <laughs> sorry. Well, Werner, did you see uh, Werner um, put out in April like a little eight-minute um, video. Did you see that yeah, one where he said he, and that's, and that's how I've been feeling too. He basically said, there's a lot of light coming on the planet right now. And that's yeah. what I've been plugging into. I've been right. sitting here at Ivy house, meditating three or four hours a day for the past seven months. And, mm -hmm. um, and I feel this magical shift. And, and I, and, you know, since I started in TM years mm -hmm. ago, Maharishi used to talk about that, the critical, critical mass, right. The critical, right. uh, you know, the, the shifting consciousness and, as a meditator and a spiritual teacher, to me, that is, that's what's happening, has the potential to happen now mm -hmm. is a critical mass so that all those people that are way on, that are both on the polarities, they're automatically uplifted when the critical mass happens. And all of a sudden, because I have seen it over the years, you know, mm -hmm. whether it was my father that was open to learning how to meditate you know, 20 years ago, I was like almost fell off my chair when he said he wanted to meditate. I'm, I never thought he would. And, right. you know, different signs that we see that there is evolution happening. There is a shift in consciousness happening if we choose to look at it. 
you right. know, and, and not, you know, choose to, to be a part of the arguments and a part of the polarity, but part of the middle and awareness and present moment, right. part of the, you know, just be, you know, just hold, up low, uplifting in that way, holding it up in that way. That's, I feel like I've been a grounding rod for mm-hmm. the past seven months and I'm working the polls tomorrow. So I'm, I feel right. like I'm there to hold some peace. Right. Exactly. And then you just, you take action from that place, you know, so are you still part of the world? Do you still do things? So I still work with my patients say, listen, these are the things that are going on in the world. This is references to actualities about whether it's coronavirus or anything else like that and social injustice, because that's actually killing them too. Um, is there a virus that goes around that, talk, that is about the, that's affecting people that is affecting the way they see the world? And yes, our job is to bring that to their awareness as much as they can meet them at. Um, and so, and, and you can usually pretty instantaneously tell when people are willing to hear you and other people who don't, and you just, you, you send them loving kindness and you send them on the way, so to speak, you know? And so, um, and so, uh, but yes, there is a shift occurring with that shift comes turbulence so as I was I was interesting I was looking back at something I wrote at the beginning of the year before I knew about coronavirus I I knew this was going to be a turbulent year before I had ever heard of this virus um, because that's the nature there's turbulence before renaissance periods Um, and that's why I'm so hopeful for this renaissance this awakening that's occurring Um, and so uh, and yes it's part of uh, the younger generations to bring that about it's about our job to kind of help make sure there's a path that's starting to be cleared so you have a chance okay um and so well and and so yes i'm thrilled with with that with what you're talking about Crane, because that's exactly what we're supposed to do we stick with our meditation practices we stick we're kind with the people who can buy and affect us it's like me and my uh my yard my uh, every neighbor comes by and loves my paths and my yard and things like that it's a service to go out to the plants it's a service to be with them and it looks different when you love them in a certain way and then everybody sees it and then just that part of walking by so as i'm doing my little yard work i know that there's more to it than me just clearing a path okay um and so every little thing we do that's what i'm trying to get it to say every every little kindness every time you say hi to a child pet a, everything is is it's part a ripple. of making it it's a rippling it's a ripple effect. effect yeah it's huge and so and you doing your practices and going out and being at the polls is wonderful we're gonna we'll, we'll do our own things too and so but yes to be in support of people as well and then you've said hey i've done what i can to be part of this change on a deeper level as well as actually this actual level as well too, because that's where, you know, meditation in action, you know, the more Thich Nhat Hanh approach to things, you know, Um, and so, that's why I love medicine. And but as medicine, from that inflection point or turning point of the patient who is dying, and the these doctors telling me, it just my my view of medicine changed so much that everything really is healing. I mean, I have read so many books on from economics to to history, to philosophy, to everything else, and looking at the how many things we've forgotten. I've gone back and listened. I mean, there's so many things within Western medicine we've forgotten um, uh, that that even th- that that would be useful for people too. So there's so much to bring into this world. There's so much great knowledge, actual knowledge out there that when you practice it too, you can see that it works. And so um, I love essential oils and herbs and crystals and everything. And there's so many different tools that people can find to heal it's just it's it's a beautiful thing and this wakening up but part of that is too is the redeveloping socioeconomic inequality inequalities taking care of that so people aren't living in fear that's the biggest part of it that i see is there's so much fear in the world get them off of their TVs and their media points and things like that. Um, they're f- buying into the fear in the world and then go within and of course go into nature. Okay. Cause that's the great healer of all. Um, and so you meditative practice time in nature. Yes. There's a time and a place for colonoscopy. I, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep coming back to it. Um, um, and so <laughs> we could sign you up where you're at the polls, you know, you're helping people sign, vote and we'll, we'll somehow sign you up because, you know, get, get the little, 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 plane to fly overhead says get Corinna colonoscopy we're gonna go start go start go fund me or whatever those things are go fund me that would be actually cool colon, huh? yeah yes <laughs> who wants to see inside Corinne's colon and then we could have a whole <laughs> oh my god that'd be awesome 
Great. Uh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. I feel good about that. I feel good with where this has gone. Um, and yeah. <laughs> it always comes back to the ass. Man. It really, it really does. You know, it's always about the butt stuff. Well, a, good, um, a good digest. I mean, that's the funny thing is like, I, I, we talked to our kids, um, you know, I got a 10, 10, eight and you know, four and five year old. And you know, they, of course wow. they love talking about poop and stuff. Cause kids are, gross and, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. any, any fart or poop joke is hilarious to kids, but we ask them about their bowel movements. Like, why are you always talking about this? Like, mm-hmm. it's a good indicator. You know, it's a good indicator on what's going on inside. You know, and it, right. that's that's uh, uh, so. It, yes, we have we have joked about it a lot, but it you know it is a it is a good point, and 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 I think that's what's mm-hmm. all joking aside. I think what is what is really important about what you're saying is that everything can be healing. Uh, right. It's what you if you're attached to only one thing as being the only thing that can heal you and and ignore the other elements, uh, you're going to get something wrong, you know, and, and right. that's that's the that's the interesting thing. I think we uh, the holistic community has probably gone too far to the other side. It's like, no, right. I don't need to go to a doctor. <laughs> when I'm bleeding right. out of my ass for two years <laughs> because I meditate <laughs> and I have crystals and I have essential oils. It's like, right. Great story. However, you know, However. there there is a reality thing, and and that's the mm-hmm. thing that uh, you know Corinne taught me in, in, um, in my meditation practice. It's like, yes, there is a spiritual practice. Yes, there's meditation, but then there's what's right in front of you, and, and there there is a reality. We have to interact with this with this life, and we have to do that with awareness. That's going to that's going to bring you carry you through the struggle. There's the great times, you know, you have to have awareness and gratitude in the good times. You have to pay attention and you have to have gratitude in, in the struggle and all the, those times too, because you're going to learn from each of those, but you have to be present. You have to be aware. You have to ask questions and you have to really find the intuition to, to look at all those, those elements as what is really healing me, what is really healthy for me. Right. So, but it's a really exciting thing to do medicine in today's world. Um, I'm always going to do medicine in some way. Um, And Western medicine has become, you know, it's almost too bad because, you know, if I recommend a drug to somebody, they think, shit, I must be in bad shape. Gary's recommending. (laughs) It's like, don't think of it that way. Come on. You know, I know we try other things, you know, like I really did. I started somebody on an an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety medicine the other day. It's like, man, I must be in pretty bad shape. And he was, by the way. I mean, at that phase, I mean, I I didn't, he was feeling bad enough without me, like, you know, beating on. It's like, no, you really need to start with medicines till we get you better. And it was a nice thing. He gets gets better, and then here, how about some IVs to kind of help your nutritional system because you haven't been eating well? And then we'll do other things. And of course, down the road, the goal will be to get him off these antidepressants and anxieties, which have made a huge difference, potentially even life saving difference. Okay, so um, and so so you do those types of things because you recognize, wow, there is a time and a place for medicines. Everybody, that's a big mistake that some people make is they think, oh, medicines are always wrong, and or chemotherapy is almost always wrong. And that's just not true. It's it's wrong some of the times. I want to be clear about that. But um, so that we have a more wide open view of medicine where we're the healer. We see that as ourselves. Of course, recognizing it's good to get a guide sometimes. Um, I want everybody to just become their own conscious healer. And just remember, it's supposed to be fun. You know, we joke about the enlightenment means to lighten up. I mean, it's a great cosmic paradox out there, everybody. Everybody's taking things way too seriously. I mean, just uh, again, I I mean, I like to laugh at pretty much everything. And, And so... And, you know, so you know, it, it really is important because, you know, it's such an important step in terms of our healing process because because we take when we take ourselves too seriously, we've almost lost the battle, you know. And so um, so so everybody lighten up. It's a it's a tough time out there. I like I said, I really am honored that we're talking on the eve of such an important day. Um, and so and I really do hope it will be a turning point for everybody consciousness wise medicine and wise there's so many great things that are occurring out there um and i agree with you corinne in terms of the idea of this being a time of so much light and powerful energy coming in um and just all of us can tap into that too the main way to do that nature silence now i i i, I you know really thankful to have met you and you know i, I appreciate your strategic optimism and uh, your, your your realism and your your humor. This is these are things that we really need more of, um, be, because 
if you if you're convinced there's not a way out, there won't be a way out. But if you're convinced that there there is an opportunity for a way out, or and if you lean on change and the hope for change, and we come together as a community, you know, we we can have healing as a society and uh, as a culture. And and I think that's mm-hmm. that is that is what I'm looking forward to. And you know that I'm very thankful to have had, you know, the decade of you know training and meditation to have weathered this storm. And uh, you know, hopefully we can we can connect more and you know get more information and. and bring more of that into into life in my generation and, and whatnot so shifting consciousness baby shift and awareness there mm-hmm. absolutely all right gear all right guys thanks so much for Amen. your time love you thank you love so you. much this is appreciative all right take care guys yeah